Welcome to Real Surf Stories. Ride everything. My family name is Michael Gebhardt. Um, I'm from the United States. I've spent most of my life growing up in Florida, and I'm an avid windsurfer and kiter. I was a professional windsurfer and Olympic windsurfer. I competed in five Olympics. I won a couple medals, a bunch of national championships, world championship titles. I started kiting around 1999. Kite surfing for me is just an evolution of windsurfing.
what we're motivated by is the reality that everybody has the potential to express incredible things in their life, be it in sport or just to have high health and functionality to the day you decide to leave your body. Um, most of the athletes we work with, we, we try to push them and coach them into a more holistic, what I would call organic lifestyle, more connected to nature, more using nature as the default setting of where they get their wisdom from. We have a ton of information out there on the internet um, in our culture and our society and everything sound bites. It's like, oh, coffee's good for you for a couple months and now coffee's bad for you. You've got to be able to navigate and make these choices yourself. These are fundamental principles and if you don't have a philosophy of life, you're going to have a hard time functioning and, and expressing extreme health. Extreme health to me means that you can function, uh, you're in your 60s, 70s, 80s, you're still having sex, you're still dancing, you're still playing, you go kite surfing every day, whatever you love to do, and you're around for your grandparents, your business gets uh, better as you get older because you become more educated, you should get smarter as you age, and sadly most humans are actually to a certain extent getting dumber as they get older because they're getting so toxic and so unhealthy that they just end up being in survival mode trying to take care of the carcass. So what we do is we try to educate and coach people and motivate and inspire people to think about things differently, to constantly upgrade their perception of reality, and to make better choices in their life so that they can have high functionality to the day they decide to leave their body. I'm going to talk a little bit about aging. When I coach my clients and I talk to them about how long people want to live, surprisingly most people say things like, oh I don't want to live past 80. And I ask them why? What's your issue with living past 80? I mean, one of my personal goals is to have high functionality and to live to 120 years old. So I made some lifestyle changes so that I can make sure that that might be a, a potential uh, possibility in my life. Uh, I think the reason that people don't want to age is they're looking at all their friends that are the same age as them or people that are like their grandparents or their parents and they see that they're not doing well. They're, on, they're, on, they're wearing diapers, they're on 10 medications, they spend all their time going to the doctors. And the problem is that people don't have the right information. They didn't get the owner's manual when they got the body. And sadly, if you don't have the right mentors or gurus or masters in your life that you look up to to keep upgrading the quality of your life and the consciousness and the awareness and make the changes in your lifestyle, then you're going to be doomed and you're not going to live a highly functional uh, you know, life with great longevity. So if you have the right teachers in your life, you're going to have high functionality and you're going to feel good about yourself in life. You're going to have goals. You're going to have... Uh, uh, a plan and uh, you know a, an ideology that allows you to live and function until the day you decide to leave your body. If you're inflexible in a certain direction or flexible, it tells us about the health of an organ. So your ability to bend forward and touch your toes or go past touching your toes is telling about the health of your heart or the heart meridian is being governed by your flexibility or lack of flexibility in the back of your body. So if you have a healthy heart rate and you can bend forward and not just touch your toes but go past that, because I have flexibility through a huge range of motion, I'm going to have a lot of structural integrity and power and be able to do cool things like a handstand from a bent over position. So I'm 51 years old and the reason that I have, looks like I'm very strong for my size or my age or my physiology is because of the full range of motion. So I can do this to any human. I can stretch them the resistance, immediately upgrade their flexibility and their strength and structural integrity through movement and doing athletic things in their life. They have a, a, an immediate biological upgrade. The work we do is permanent and cumulative and this is what we do. We make people more flexible and it makes them incredible athletes. going to talk about what fascia is and how we affect and change fascia. Fascia is what surrounds the muscle. So if this piece of foam inside is your muscle body, say you have your bicep, and this is the fascia surrounding it, the ends of the fascia turn into ligaments and tendon attached to the bone. And the fascia, if it's glued to the muscle, then the muscle can't contract and expand its maximum length and, and, and ability to get as short as possible. So if we stretch that with tension and we, we stretch all of the different four types of muscle cells inside the cell and we start separating this fascia from the muscle which is done with maximum resistance you immediately upgrade the flexibility and the contraction potential of the muscle that's being governed inside the fascia and your nervous system in your brain which is your your nerve impulses the electromagnetic energy your body is sending that electrical signal is being controlled if the fascia is glued to the muscle or not so just like having a tight shirt or tight pants you can't move and if, you t if we take the tension out of the fascia by using maximum resistance, you immediately get a greater range of motion, you reduce the pain, you take the inflammation out of that part of the body, and the body's brains, uh, the brain's ability to communicate to the muscle as a collective is, is turned on, and that's done by separating the fascia from the muscle. What we're 
dealing with when we stretch people is the unconsciousness. The pain that you can't handle is the unconsciousness hidden in the body. And the and it's the negative unconscious, what I call the pain body. And uh, if, if I move somebody and they get overwhelmed with the emotional feeling and it goes over their perception of reality and, they're like, <gasps> and they can't deal with it, then we lower the output to where they can stay present and look down at their unconscious coming up and trying to take over. So in a relationship or with, uh, if you get in a car accident and somebody starts yelling at you and you get in a fight, you went unconscious, right? And what you're running off is you're running off patterns and the patterns are fear and guilt and shame, all the negative uh, negative energy thought forms, uh, pride, um, frustration, anxiety, and then all the stuff that's above courage and above us, 200 on a scale of consciousness. And this is a little bit out there, but uh, one of my favorite teachers is David R. Hawkins. So when we stretch people, what we're doing is we're pushing them to the limit of what they can take. And it, it looks like simple movements, but when we start moving somebody and generate resistance, you, you as you get overpowered, when you lose control or you start getting beaten, there's a part of you that's like, oh my God, I'm losing, I'm dying. And we try to stay in control as humans. And there's three major fears that humans have. And those three fears are fear of acceptance, which is your relationship with others, fear of loss of control, and ultimately what we're all dealing with with the pandemic is fear of death. So the first two, if you make a post on Facebook and somebody doesn't agree with it and they're upset with you, you can see how much it eats your day. Oh, that one person's not happy with me. I've said something and they don't like my relationship or my perspective. But, you know, talk about religion, talk about sex, talk about um, all of your uh, positionality in life, which are hundreds of thousands of different positions, and they go and diametrically oppose duality. So the stretching makes you deal with the duality sitting in your body, which is your ability to where you're healthy and comfortable and functional, and then to be taken and maybe into an injured part of the body that's weak. And what's interesting is you don't have to be injured to find trauma hidden in the body, but what, what I'll find when I stretch you is weakness or a lack of of strength and then what shows up is you have fascia and then when the practitioner is working on something that hurts the person is being initiated into finding out that oh my god my i got misery in my body it doesn't matter who i stretch we're going to find something miserable so what they're doing is you're generating force and i'm trying to find the path of most resistance and take them consciously with, as he stays breathing into something that's miserable hidden in the body and there's two types of trauma that people store. One is an acute trauma, which is like an accident or a divorce or your mother you know, disowning you or breaking up with your girlfriend or your business partner robbing you or getting beaten up. Tickled to death as a kid, it can be hundreds of little insults. People cut you off in traffic and then you, you miss the, the green light and then you miss your business meeting and then you want to kill the person that caused it, right? And then there's a repetitive trauma, which is doing something over and over again, being a, a, an athlete or playing too much tennis or a runner. And so as we age, we get tighter to defend against the body breaking down. And the reason that the body breaks down is the next day we wake up and something hurts and we don't want to use the part of ourselves that hurts. So just like in a relationship, if you get really hurt, what do you do? You disown your, your mate, oh, I'm getting divorced. And you don't even know why you got divorced. You ask your friends, why did you get divorced? Well, I'm not even sure what she was upset about. I sort of have an idea. But these are acute traumas. And what happens is the physiology, if the mind matrix can't handle the insult, it goes and hides in the body energetically. And it shows up as tension as you resist something. Because if you didn't resist anything, you wouldn't have any problems with anything. And the opposite of resisting something is finding everything humorous, right? So if you look at <laughs> if you look at somebody that's funny, like Jim Carrey, he's hyper flexible. So he's hyper flexible mentally. So this, this, people don't want to believe that there's a contextual concomitant correlation in three C's <laughs> that between what you think and what you perceive and what happens in your physiology. And comedians live the longest of, of all of the races of it, or the uh, vocations inside of humans because they don't take anything seriously so nothing gets stuck in their body. <laughs> so people that laugh can, and not take life seriously. So imagine they get in a car accident and the guy is so upset he wants to kill you. He's got a gun, he just came from the drug gun range, but then you make a joke, oh man, you know, I was I was texting and chewing gum and, and my wife is bitching at me and I, I'm so sorry I wasn't, you know, and the guy's like, you know, and you get the guy laughing, he's not gonna kill you. But if you get serious, we take ourselves too seriously, right? And then the insult becomes a, a real offense and then you act it out because you gotta bleed off this energy. So when we stretch people, when we were stretching George, George is on the edge of crying a number of times and we were doing gentle, smooth resistance and what was happening is he's watching, he's observing his unconscious come up and then he's getting overwhelmed with the feeling of emotional. Now feelings are interesting because there's two types of feelings, the physical pain 
And then there's the emotional pain, which we don't have the discernment to separate the two, right? So he gets waves of physical, ah, oh, my shoulder hurts, it hasn't been in that position, it's really tight. And then he gets this overwhelming wave of unconscious that takes over. Now he's looking through the filter of some trauma at an emotional feeling level, and he doesn't want to deal with it. So then the breathing stops, you know, and you go into defense mode because, you know, you're being reminded of being attacked, assaulted on some level, insulted. And then by staying present and breathing and, and picking an output of effort that he can handle, he brings the unconscious down. He stops it from overwhelming him and running this and that because this is when we do stupid shit to each other. You know, we get violent, we get frustrated, we lose our temper, we lose our patience. You know, and I can do it with my kid alone. You know, if, if my kid is wanting attention, three-year-old, four-year-old kid, and either my wife or, or myself are paying attention, he'll do something bad because he doesn't care what kind of attention he gets as long as he gets attention because that's what he wants, right? And we do the same thing with others. So he pushes his unconscious down. Now he gets to look down at his dysfunction and he gets to own more of it and go, hey, I had a choice in watching the trigger come up and you know, I'm looking through that filter of unconsciousness and I cannot let it take over my life. And then he develops himself physically, emotionally, mentally, and more importantly, spiritually, which is the big picture, what I would more importantly call consciousness. So if you can develop your consciousness through stretching, you get to resolve all the issues you have in your life. So it's a really funny thing to do to work on somebody physically. This isn't, we're not going to the gym. This isn't an aerobic workout or a strength training workout. I'm trying to literally, my intention is to remove trauma from the person by them generating resistance. And you're like, what are you talking about? But you will find that anybody that's moved with resistance will find something that hurts. You'll find misery hidden in your body. And you walk around your body, you have no idea that your body is physically miserable. So at the unconscious level, imagine waking up, the average human's having like 60,000 thoughts a day, and 40,000 of the same ones, and a huge amount of them are negative. Push this one out. And he's getting into sort of like a Tai Chi flow, so now he's starting to guide his push, push fully forward into me. And he's gonna start finding stuff that he wants to deal with. And he won't even know what it is. I'm working this arm. He's a stomach body type, so he's very strong and generated force through the arm as he went. Most people would fail and wouldn't be able to take that sort of force in the arm. Their body weight would be enough. But we're opening the front of his body, which gets tighter and shorter from, his, from just aging. And he's teaching himself how to more aggressively go after the, and give me the, the, the access to the the uncomfortable tissue in his body and the range of motion where he's stuck. So when somebody comes inflexible, they actually tell you about the health of the organs because the organ is, is regulated and the muscle is regulated by an electrical system. And when something becomes weak, it's low voltage. So when we talk about Chinese medicine or the organ body types, we're talking about the electrical output that the body has. So press down and he wants tricep work, which is actually the worst part of everything we've worked on. I think the tricep is liver and a little bit of heart meridian. And hold the arms down. He's been breathing the whole time, so he's going into an altered state. So this is almost a rebirthing or you know, holotropic breathing technology, Wim Hofing, pranayama, whatever you want to call it. But this gets people very high. And he doesn't need any drugs. So this is the same high you get when, you know, my wife's about to have her, our second child and, you know, she's not going to use any medication and she will breathe, she'll get her breathing so intense that so she'll start changing her chemistry and she'll go in an altered state and then she can deal with, the, you know, a most incredibly painful thing and actually go to it. And some people will have orgasmic births, some women, they can get into such a high state that it, instead of it being like negative, it can be like the most profound and primal, like, you know, joyous experience because she's, you know so intimately involved with the process of life. Push, push, go back. You'll find a certain range of motion, like right in here at a chunk where he didn't want to resist. So there's some hidden unconscious stuff in that part of the body energetically. Push back. Yeah, it's better now, yeah. As George is young, is strong, and so he can generate a lot of output. So it's amazing to find that in certain areas, there's like, no, there's nothing there, there's no force. So I'm taking, I'm, I'm making a deal with it. He's breathing, and 
So he's digesting unconsciously something that got stuck in the body. It's coming out. What we're doing is removing the past in the person, removing the luggage, the baggage, the trauma, the thoughts, the frequencies, the information, the memories. He's outputting huge. He's almost getting lifting off the ground right now. So now he's actively and willingly going after something that was miserable before. So that's a nice shift. That's a fun thing to watch somebody dig into their the misery and the transcend it. So we're so much about avoiding pain in our culture. You know, think about people dying on opiates. You know, so you're, you're in hospice and you're dying of brain cancer and they got you mega dosed with, you know, you don't, we're, we're dead. We don't, we've lost our feeling. Women have babies, they're anesthetized. You know, the baby stone comes in. Baby didn't feel anything. And then you're like, oh, the baby wouldn't breastfeed so now you're giving a formula because it couldn't latch onto the mommy's nipple but the baby was wasted because you gave the mother epidural, you know. This is the world we live in. So, so learning how to face the pain and discomfort at a very gentle, present level. And then George, come tell us a little bit of what, about what you feel now. So he's over here checking it out. What changed? Uh, what did you become aware of? Anything? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Feel great. Feel very clear. Very. Uh, you very feel embodied. Very. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Looks a lot different. A lot more grounded. Wow. Huh? Yeah, that was a nice little session. Yeah, it was very, very trancy, as you were saying, Mike. It was, uh, yeah. Just trying to stay with it, trying to breathe, trying to stay uh, in the body versus letting that unconscious override myself. And then up in Lotus, double Lotus pose, yeah. which isn't my strength. Yeah, and it's now, instead of it hurting, it's it's a grounding, relaxing posture. Yeah. And that's a great place to, to ground yourself and meditate, which is to be in a state of no mind for a bit, right? Take a break from your thinking. Yeah, thank you for sharing. We take all that wisdom we've learned and we download on people and we have some really cool things that we share and we, we get our hands on a lot of different uh, people with some issues in their tissues and we fix people fast. So very exciting, a lot of fun for us. We're honored to have a community center where we can be of service and help people uh, get their confidence or hope up and, and find a way to function better and want to live longer and have more life in their years and more years in their life and that's what we're all about.